the two elderly gentlemen at the retirement home talking to one another one morning, and the first one says, boy, I got a brand new hearing aid, and it's really great. The other one says, yeah, what kind is it? He says, about 1230. <laughs> Bear that in mind as I read this parable. And he taught them many things in parables, and in his teaching he said to them, listen, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured it. Other seed fell on rocky ground where it had not much soil, and immediately it sprang up since it had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, it was scorched, and since it had no root, it withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it and yielded no grain. And other seeds fell into good soil and brought forth grain, growing up and increasing and yielding thirtyfold, sixtyfold, indeed a hundredfold. And he said, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Jeff will explain it all later. Thank you, Frank. <laughs> In that same chapter, Jesus wasn't done yet, and I'm going to continue with a couple other short parables that goes along with the one that Frank just read. Jesus also said, the kingdom of God is as if someone would scatter seed on the ground and would sleep and rise night and day, and the seed, seed would sprout and grow. He does not know how. The earth produces of itself first the stalk, then the head, then the full grain in the head. But when the grain is ripe, at once he goes in with his sickle, because the harvest has come. Jesus also said, with what can we compare the kingdom of God or what parable will we use for it? It is like a mustard seed, which when sown upon the ground is the smallest of all seeds on earth. Yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes the greatest of all shrubs and puts forth large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. You may not be aware, those of you from rural parts uh, all over the United States might be aware, those of you who grew up in, in the city, you're generally aware, but you may not be aware of the fact that all over the United States today, and most especially in the Midwest and the upper Midwest, they're right in the middle of harvest season. And because I was a pastor, in rural parishes for 15 out of my 35 years. I was a pastor to farmers for those years and I knew the flow of that rural life, that flow between planting and harvesting and all that goes with it. And I've been in many places. I've seen different kinds of crops grow and get a good sense of when they are. For instance, it's not wheat harvest time. That was in the middle of July but they are harvesting corn. And in northern Minnesota and northern North Dakota, they are harvesting sugar beets. Now, I've seen a lot of harvests. The sugar beet season is about the most intense harvest season I've ever seen in my life. In fact, they don't even call it a harvest. They call it the sugar beet campaign. That's a sugar beet. Tell me how they get granular sugar out of that. It's quite the process, and I've studied the process, and it's a difficult process. How they figured it out, I'll never know, but that's a sugar beet. Look how big it is. They grow huge. Let me show you the next slide. That's a sugar beet field that's ready to go. And then the next slide. Before you harvest the sugar beets, you got to cut off all the tops. And after you cut off all the tops, then you go in with what they call the lifters, and you lift them out of the ground. Look how big they are. And you put them in trucks. And it is quite the process. And the, thank you. And the sugar beet season is short. 
when when the co-op and all the sugar beets are processed by co-ops that the farmers join together sugar beet farmers are the most uh, are the most organized farmers on the on the planet when when their co-op says go they go and there's a formula wheat to sugar content ratio that they're constantly measuring so they can see when the beets are most ready and the farmers will make the most money. But it also has to be at the time when the first freeze comes because they pile up the beets in huge mountains at beet stations because the processing plants can't take them all at one time. And so when they, when they mount up all these beets in these mountains out in the middle of the country, they sit there for a while, and you gotta have freezing weather, otherwise the intensity of the heat and the moisture inside these piles of beets will cause the beets to rot. So they gotta be frozen. So there's a balance between this sugar to weight ratio to get your best money, but you can't go into the fields until, it has, until a freeze has come, and, and it's a fluctuating ratio. If you wait too long, the sugar to weight ratio begins to decrease and you're going to lose money. But you got to wait till it freezes in order to get the beets out of the field. And so it's intense. And the farmers are waiting with bated breath for the co-ops to say go because every day they have to wait longer. They're losing money. And then finally the co-op says go and they go. And they only got two to three weeks to do it and then they're done. That means they're going 24-7, all day, all night. And because I was the pastor of beet farmers, they wanted me to see their operation. So I went out with them sometimes in the daytime, but also in the middle of the night to watch this operation. It's the only time I got to see these parishioners for three weeks. World Communion Sunday is the worst attended Sunday of the year because all the beet farmers are in the fields that day. But it's an intense, intense process. And it takes a lot of patience, and then it takes a lot of energy. It's going one from one extreme to the next. And it's quite the thing to watch. You know, I've talked to many farmers throughout the years, and, you know, I talked to one farmer after a bad year where, where the fields flooded at the wrong time, and they couldn't get to the crop, and the crop rotted in the field. And I said to him, I said, doesn't it drive you crazy to be in this business? And you know what he said to me? He smiled and he said, nope. He said, the good Lord is going to do what the good Lord is going to do. And if you can't handle what the good Lord's going to do, you shouldn't be a farmer. <laughs> that's, that's good wisdom, folks. And he was a good farmer. And they were all good people. In February 2014, 13 of us went to Palestine to plant olive trees. There we are. That's the team that went from this church and other places in Palestine. We're in, we're in a little town, Beit Sahur, just outside Bethlehem. There we are, ready to pile onto the bus to go plant olive trees. And well, we went out into the fields, and let me tell you, it's, it's like, it was like old home week for me because when we went out to the fields, and I met Palestinian farmers, even though they're a different culture, different language, different dress. It was like being with my farmers in Kansas or Minnesota, people of the ground, people of the earth, or people of the earth. I could tell by the strong, calloused hands. I could tell by the weather-beaten face they're the same kind of down-to-earth people. Here's a picture of a Palestinian farmer out on his field. That's my daughter standing next to him. That's where we were planting trees. And, 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 and he, he knew very little English, a little bit, and we talked a little bit. And he's just like the guys that I was a pastor to in the rural Midwest. And, you know, um, we even one day had a big feast out in the middle of the field after we got done working. They brought the food in, and we sat there on the ground, and we ate a wonderful Palestinian meal. 
That reminded me, because I'd go out with farmers on their harvests and their work just to be with them during that time, whether it was wheat or corn or beets, whatever it was. And sure enough, farm families at lunchtime, they don't call it lunch, they call it dinner, would bring a big meal right out to the field. And we'd just all sit in the field and we'd eat. And that's exactly what we did in Palestine. I mean, it was exactly the way life is in agricultural USA. And you know, after all my years in ministry, and even after encountering those Palestinian farmers, knowing that that is a very conflicted part of the world, I think the solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is to get rid of all the politicians on both sides of the struggle and put the farmers in charge. <laughs> After all, if you know the history of the conflict, which I do, there was a time in Palestine when Palestinians and Jews were neighbors and worked side by side on their farms in peace. That changed when certain people got ideology in their head and decided to live for the ideology more than they chose to live for peace and harmony in the human community. And friends, that is sin. Because that is not the intentions of our Creator who gave us the land and gave us the hands to work it. Jesus said, the kingdom of God is as if someone would scatter seed on the ground and would sleep and rise night and day and the seed would sprout and grow. He does not know how. You know what Jesus was trying to say to us? He was saying that trying to understand the kingdom of God as earthly people is as difficult as trying to understand exactly what it is that makes our crops grow. You know, we can explain the science of it easy. We are very sophisticated, forward people. And in these days and age, a scientist can tell us all sorts of things about how crops grow and how you can make them grow better. What science can't tell us are the whys and the hows. What science can't tell us about is about the one who makes it all go. And when it comes to that, it takes people of faith who understand what Jesus is saying here. That we rise and we go to sleep and we wait and we have patience because we don't have that knowledge. And all we can have is patience. Patience with a hope that knows that God will see us through. Now, I'll tell you, and those who went on the trip with me last time can attest to this. There's a different kind of patience that these Palestinian farmers need. They, they need the typical type of patience that you wait through the weather and you deal with all the realities that the weather can bring in regard to your crop. But you're also planting and harvesting your crop in the, in the midst of politics that are swirling all around you. Not only that, you are planting and harvesting and having patience and hoping that other human beings will not come in in the middle of the night and destroy your crop. When we were there, in 2014, in those olive fields, we saw with our own eyes 
old, old olive trees, dead and blackened, because someone came in in the middle of the night and poisoned the ground in which they grew. When we were there, we saw entire fields of olive trees that were uprooted, taken by the military, transported back to Israel, and replanted. And we saw trees, fields of trees, destroyed by someone's chainsaws. And we were there when the military came and told us to stop planting for an hour or two while they checked to make sure the Palestinian farmer owned the field we were working on, which they already knew was true because that farmer had, that had been in his family for centuries. There was no secret about who owned the land. But we watched it with our own eyes. It was politics, the politics of harassment. Yes, regardless of where you are in the world, it takes patience to be a farmer, just as Jesus pointed out. I have a sense of that patience that Jesus speaks because of the last trip we took. You know, after our hard working, hard work planting trees, which is hard work. We, I hope tomorrow when we leave, they tell me that it's easier to pick olives than it is to plant trees. I hope so, because it was hard work. But when we got back from our trip in 2014, within a month of our return, we found out that hundreds of the trees that we had planted had been uprooted. Now, part of me wonders what I would have done if that was my land and I had my trees in and somebody did that. You know, the Presbyterian Church USA pledges to engage only with those in the conflict who are committed to peacemaking, who will seek only peaceful resolve in the conflict. That is our commitment as a church because we're a peacemaking church. But I'll be honest with you. If I had been there at that moment, they were uprooting my trees. I wonder if I could have partnered with myself. Truly. How much of a heart for peacemaking would have I had at that moment? I can't tell you. I would hope I would live in accordance with the teaching of Christ, but I can't tell you for sure how I'd react if that had been my livelihood. You know, in broken English, one of those Palestinian farmers in the field thanked me. He thanked a lot of people, but he, he came up and thanked me, thanked us for being in the field that day because he knew he would not have been permitted to be there to plant his trees if we had not been with him. And he said that it gave him and his family and his village, it gave them all hope, knowing there were people from America and Europe who cared this much. Jesus said, when a mustard seed is sown, it grows up and becomes the greatest of all shrubs and puts forth large branches so that all the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. Imagine such a world. That's what World Communion Sunday calls us to do. Imagine such a world. And that gives me the hope that I take with me as I go back and pick olives this coming week. Amen.